to our Sunday worship. I pray that you are ready to praise God with me, to worship Him with our hearts, with our mouths, even with our hands. On the day I called, you answered me.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light through from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne Hi Church, welcome to our online service. We're so happy that you could join us for today's worship. We are active in our social media platforms, so if you have any inquiries, you have any prayer requests, or you need encouragement, please message us through our Facebook and our Instagram accounts. We'll be so glad to accommodate all your inquiries. You can also be updated by our with our upcoming events and what the church is all about or who we are as a church. And you can check our website as well. Today, I remember Charles Spurgeon who said, It is not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. It is not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. And I remember when Charles Spurgeon says that or said that, I remember 
Paul where he mentions a church who gave who didn't have much but they gave with all their hearts who were filled with joy in their hearts because they were able to give in 2nd Corinthians chapter 8 it says now I want you to know dear brothers and sisters what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia they are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor but they are also filled with abundant joy which is which has overflowed in rich generosity now look at that church experiencing so many experiencing so many trials experiencing so many troubles they experienced so many things in their time and probably the same with us today but for them they gave not because they were rich not because they had much but the bible says because they were filled with abundant joy and that joy resulted in generosity now i want to encourage you as we give today as we give our tithes as we give our offerings to our lord let your hearts be filled with joy in giving not out of obligation not out of duty but out of worship out of worship for god that he has blessed us so much more than we could ever imagine and he has taken care of us for forever like all our lives he has taken care of us and by giving we want to say lord it is our joy that we can give to you let us pray lord we thank you that we can give to you it is a, a great privilege lord that we can worship you by giving and so god we pray that as we give you'd fill our hearts with joy that we may worship you rightfully and also lord as we give may you use the offerings that we give to establish your kingdom here on this earth and may you bless those who will steward it and lord we pray that many will be reached many will come into the saving knowledge of our lord jesus through this giving god we thank you and we pray these things in jesus name amen It is now time for us to listen to God's word through Brother Jonathan.
morning, WordCom family. Blessed Sunday to you all. This morning, we're going to reflect together on a beautiful story of transformation from the Bible. Really, we could say it's a story of conversion. Now, sometimes when we think of conversion, you know, we, we think of the story of the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus, where he was knocked off the horse and blinded and uh, ends up really being completely changed in a moment from Saul to Paul. But this morning we're going to reflect on a story of a different kind of conversion on another road, the road to Emmaus. And this is, I would like to say, more of a story of a a gentle, gradual awakening, a conversion that happens over time on a process of things becoming more clear and unfolding. Now, if you will allow me, I'd like to reflect on this familiar story with you in five movements or five, um, we could say, uh, portions of the story. The first movement is that Jesus draws near the disciples, but they don't recognize him. Now this itself already gives us two very important uh, things to be aware of. The first is that God is a God of mission. God is a God of outreach. God is the God who always shows up. God is the God who initiates. God is the God who draws near. It's not just that we are seeking. We we do seek. We can seek. The Bible tells us to seek. But once we seek, we realize <laughs> it's God who's been already looking for me. Because God is the God who draws near. But the challenge here is that the disciples in this narrative did not recognize Jesus. The Jesus that they had followed, believed in, trusted, walked with, they didn't recognize him. Now the text tells us that these two disciples were downcast, their eyes were downcast, their faces were downcast, their hearts were downcast. And this can be one of the reasons why we too, at times, don't recognize Jesus. You know, we can become very caught up in the things that discourage us, the things that pull us down, the things that... um, cause us to feel um, in, in a bad place. You know, this uh, quarantine, these months, for many, this has cr- given us a spirit of discouragement, downcast hearts, and negativity. You know, there are another reason. There's another reason that sometimes we miss on seeing God, seeing Jesus, and that's because we are distracted. And that's and distraction, we look we seek out distraction to try and relieve our boredom. Now, a lot of people were also bored in the quarantine. You know, can't wait to get out again. Can't wait to return to my normal routine. Can't wait to get out of the house. Because we're bored. So we look for distraction. Sign up for new webinars. Watch more Netflix. These are not bad in themselves, but distractions can also, boredom and distractions can also keep us from noticing, recognizing God. 
So it's important that we we know that number one, God is always drawing near, and number two, there are things in our lives, in our hearts, that can keep us from recognizing God. The second movement is we see that Jesus begins to teach and interpret, and their hearts burned within them. Jesus is a teacher. Jesus teaches us through his words of teaching. Jesus teaches us through his life and example. But he begins by listening. Jesus begins by listening. He first asks them a question. What are you talking about? What things? Tell me more. Jesus doesn't just come in with a prepackaged message. He doesn't give them a message that doesn't respond to where they are. He begins with where they are. He asks them, tell me. He has that relationship. Now, I like the words in the narrative. It's actually towards the end of the narrative where the the two disciples say to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us? You see, Jesus doesn't just teach points of information. Jesus teaches in a way that speaks to the heart that reaches in and touches the heart, that stirs up and awakens the heart, that starts to warm and set the heart on fire. Jesus teaches and brings meaning, and he teaches to the heart. He speaks to the heart, and so their hearts burned within them. The third movement is when they are almost at the town or almost at the home of these two disciples in Emmaus. After walking for a few hours, they're almost there. You know, the sun is probably just beginning to set, and he pretends like he's going to keep going. He pretends like he has somewhere else to go. He pretends like he doesn't really want to stay. And yet, these two disciples prevail on him. They say, no, 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 please, please, come in. Come in and stay. It's almost night. Gabina. It's safer It's better if you stay. And so, in this third movement, Jesus enters as guest. He enters as guest when they invite him. He doesn't presume, doesn't force. In fact, we could say he almost pretends like he wants to go on. But they invite him. And so he stays as guest. And that leads to the fourth movement or moment when they're already in the home, they've taken their sandals off and washed their feet, they've made themselves comfortable, they're sitting somewhere at a table or at a a cushion and they're ready to share a meal. And Jesus does something that he had done a number of times already in the Gospels. The risen Lord takes the bread, gives thanks, breaks it, and shares it. 
something that he had done in the feeding of the 5,000. It's something that he had done at the, in the upper room. This, uh, this sort of template of taking, blessing, breaking, and sharing. And in that moment, Jesus the guest becomes Jesus the host. Jesus, who was invited in and accepts the invitation and comes in and stays as guest, now, all of a sudden, takes the authority, the initiative to take and bless and break and share the bread. And in that moment, in that moment, Jesus changes from guest to host And their eyes were opened. It was like scales fell from their eyes. And they recognized the Lord in that moment. Was there, were there bells? Was there smoke? Was there a drum roll? No. In fact, the incredible thing is they recognized Jesus in an ordinary, everyday, mundane moment. The ordinary, everyday, mundane breaking and sharing of bread. Jesus had taught them, beginning with the prophets, through all of the testimony of the Old Testament. And their eyes were still not open. But in that moment of breaking of bread, they recognize the Lord with them. How often do we miss seeing Jesus, seeing the Lord, finding God in the most ordinary, mundane, everyday moments, relationships, situations, I I came out today to share this message with you in the little garden beside our home. And the garden teaches me so many things. The ways that soil needs to be cultivated. The ways that sprouts fight against all odds to come up in between the crack in cement the ways that life continues to flourish but also needs care. These are all these aren't great scientific uh, discoveries. These are observations from ordinary everyday life. God is like that. God comes to us in a handshake, in a smile. God speaks to us in our tired body. God speaks to us in uh, the beautiful harmony of a song. God speaks to us in so many ordinary ways. We just need to have eyes and hearts that are open, ready, receptive, attentive to notice that the risen Lord is with us. That leads us to 
the fifth and last moment or movement in this narrative. And it's, I think, probably the, the uncomfortable one. You know, it feels good that Jesus draws near. We enjoy that Jesus teaches. We are so grateful when Jesus is our guest. And oh, praise God, it's wonderful when our eyes are opened and we recognize the Lord as our host. But this fifth moment, this fifth movement is unsettling. And the fifth movement and moment is this. As soon as they saw Jesus for who he was, as soon as they recognized the Lord, he disappears from their sight. Why is it that moments of awesome intimacy can't last forever? Why is it that victories in life and in faith don't keep on coming? Why is it that experiences of faith are sometimes fleeting and hard to, to hold on to, elusive even? Well, maybe that's the whole meaning of the faith journey. Faith is believing what we cannot see. They had seen the risen Christ. They had recognized Jesus. But then he was taken away. He was again invisible to them. But oh, that moment of recognition, that moment of knowing, knowing that they know who had been with them and who was with them and who was alive changed these two disciples forever. They got up from the table, ran out the door, and hurried back to Jerusalem in the middle of the night to tell the rest of the disciples everything that had happened. Now I must end on another troubling or challenging note of realism. This narrative is only found in two of the Gospels, Luke and Mark. In Mark uh, chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, we find uh, a shorter version of this narrative. And in Mark's version, we read that the two disciples hurry back and tell the other disciples what had happened, what had, they had seen and experienced, and it wasn't believed. It wasn't received. This can be a great discouragement when the people close to us, the people around us, don't receive, don't understand, don't receive, don't support, don't embrace our experiences of faith. But that does not make our experiences of faith any less real, powerful, and transformative. Church, I want to encourage you this morning. You know, some of us may have had a Damascus Road conversion, like Paul change dramatically. Some of us may be on an Emmaus road of conversion where our awareness, our 
response to. We are so grateful when Jesus is our guest. And oh, praise God, it's wonderful when our eyes are opened and we recognize the Lord as our host. But this fifth moment, this fifth movement is unsettling. And the fifth movement and moment is this. As soon as they saw Jesus for who he was, as soon as they recognized the Lord, he disappears from their sight. Why is it that moments of awesome intimacy can't last forever? Why is it that victories in life and in faith don't keep on coming? Why is it that experiences of faith are sometimes fleeting and hard to, to hold on to, elusive even. Well, maybe that's the whole meaning of the faith journey. Faith is believing what we cannot see. They had seen the risen Christ. They had recognized Jesus. But then he was taken away. He was again invisible to them. But oh, that moment of recognition, that moment of knowing, knowing that they know who had been with them and who was with them and who was alive changed these two disciples forever. They got up from the table, ran out the door, and hurried back to Jerusalem in the middle of the night to tell the rest of the disciples everything that had happened. Now I must end on another troubling or challenging note of realism. This narrative is only found in two of the Gospels, Luke and Mark. In Mark uh, chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, we find uh, a shorter version of this narrative. And in Mark's version, we read that the two disciples hurry back and tell the other disciples what had happened, what had, they had seen and experienced, and it wasn't believed, it wasn't received. This can be a great discouragement when the people close to us, the people around us, don't, receive, don't understand, don't receive, don't support, don't embrace our experiences of faith, but that does not make our experiences of faith any less real, powerful, and transformative. Church, I want to encourage you this morning. You know, some of us may have had a Damascus Road conversion like Paul, changed dramatically. Some of us may be on an Emmaus road of conversion where our awareness, our response to, our embrace and understanding is something that's just growing and building and emerging over a long process of time. But I want to encourage you this morning that God draws 
near. God draws near. Always. God always shows up. God teaches to our heart. God teaches in ways that speak to and touch the deepest parts of our hearts to make them warm and alive and burning. God, on our invitation, enters our hearts and our lives as guests. But then, God also initiates and authoritatively becomes our host, sharing with us life in ways that we understand and recognize. And God changes us deeply so that even in the times, the moments, the seasons where we feel like we don't see God anymore, we know deep in our hearts, even when others don't believe or reject our message, that God is alive and with us and has changed us forever. Amen.